Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning and welcome to FaithBridge. It's great to see all of you here today, whether you are in Center Court East, Center Court West, if you're up at the Woodlands, or if you're coming to us online We're glad that you've chosen to worship at FaithBridge today. We're going to be talking about discipling our children, helping our children grow in their relationship with God. Some of you are aware that uh, I spent this last week on a field trip with about 15 or 16 eighth graders going up to Washington, D.C. and New York City, and there was a A time or two during that, I thought about changing the sermon to disciplining our (laughs) children. No, they were a great group. We had a really good time, and uh, I'm looking forward to to talking to you, encouraging you this morning about how we can help our kids be disciples of Jesus Christ, who make more and stronger disciples of Jesus Christ in their own lives. Uh, But before we do that, let's take a moment and pray together. Father, thank you for making us your children, for adopting us into your family, for loving us, for growing us up, conforming us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who works in and through us to mature us and help us grow. Thank you for the gift of children for the joy that they bring, yes, Lord, even for the challenges they they present, for even in those challenges, our own discipleship is perfected. As we look at your word this morning, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. When my wife Becky and I had been married for just over a year, she suggested one week that we uh, take the um, upcoming weekend and uh, have a little getaway, just go off for a couple of days and leave it all behind and rest, spend some time together, sounded like a great idea to me. So we went up to the North Georgia mountains to one of our favorite B&Bs and uh, having just a terrific time. That first night, we went to the restaurant there uh, in the in the B and B, and after we had placed our order with the waiter, Becky suggested that that we go ahead and and bless the food before it even arrived. And I said, "Okay, that's fine." So we closed our eyes, bowed our heads, and and prayed. And when I opened my eyes, there before me was a little clear plastic box that uh, had. Uh, some type of terry cloth material inside of it. And uh, I did not know what to make of that. I kind of looked at Becky, uncertain. I'm thinking to myself, why on earth did she give me wristbands? I don't don't play tennis, uh, but I guess I ought to act happy. I mean, it's obviously something she's giving me, and she's looking at me rather expectantly with, you know, this happy look on her face, and uh, I, I'm not getting it. And uh, she said, Dan, those are booties. <laughs> well, believe it or not, I, I still didn't get it. <laughs> it didn't compute. Like, they look awfully small. <laughs> With a bit of exasperation, she said, Dan, we are having a baby. Well, yeah, <laughs> clap, clap, clap. In a word, in that moment, I was stunned. Not because I was necessarily surprised at the fact that we were having a baby. I mean, we had decided some months earlier that we were ready to start a family. But in that moment, it, it fell on me like a ton of bricks oh my gosh, we are bringing a human being into this world for whom we will be responsible, and they will be watching me, me, 
for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I am the biggest jerk in the world. That, that sense of responsibility was just so huge that I, I did not leap to my feet in celebration. I did not say, oh, wow, that's awesome. I just sat there, stunned, dazed. It was not the reaction that my wife was looking for, <laughs> I can assure you. Well, after a little bit, I managed to pull myself together and uh, was able to enter fully into the celebration and the happiness and the joy because I, I really was excited that this time had come. But that sense of responsibility was there. My guess would be that when it comes to the notion of discipling our children, that same sense of uh, Fearful responsibility rests on many of our shoulders. It, it, it is a, a daunting responsibility for many of us. Today, though, I, I want to be an encourager. Yes, it is a serious responsibility. Absolutely. We're talking about eternal matters here. But it does not have to be an impossible responsibility. It doesn't have to be a terrifying responsibility. It actually can be one that is incredibly joyful, bring a tremendous amount of satisfaction to both ourselves and to our children. It is possible to do that. And to guide our thinking, I want us to look at a passage from the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10 Go ahead and turn in your Bibles there. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. Ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one that can be yours to keep. You can consider that our gift to you. Mark is the second book in the New Testament, the second gospel. In Mark chapter 10, we're going to begin reading in verse 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. I want us to focus our attention this morning on one verse in particular in there, verse 14, one phrase in particular. Jesus says, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. Do not hinder them. That word hinder means, of course, to stop an action that is in progress, to bring to a halt something that is already underway. I want to begin encouraging you this morning by letting you know movement toward Jesus, a desire to know Jesus, a desire to be a part of the kingdom of Jesus is already underway in the life of your child, whether you are aware of it or not. Children are quite naturally drawn to Jesus. Jesus himself said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And so our task is not so much to, to work up a bunch of excitement about Jesus, to somehow motivate our children toward Jesus as much as it is removing the hindrances, getting the things out of the way that stand between our children and Jesus. Jesus has an attractiveness all his own. That if a child can see clearly, there's nothing that stands between the child and the beauty and the loveliness and the graciousness, the kindness of Jesus, they're going to move in that direction. And so a large part of our job as the disciples of our kid is simply to move the things out of the way. Now perhaps you say to me, well, Gosh, Dan, easy for you to say. I mean, after all, you're a pastor. I'm, I'm not a pastor. I don't even work in kids' ministry. You don't understand how inept I am, how underqualified I am. Well, notice, the, the command is not given to pastors. 
It's not given to children's workers. It's not even particularly given to parents. It's given to all of us. All of us in the body of Christ have and share this responsibility, whether we are parents or not. Anybody who loves kids, anybody who loves God and cares about his children have the responsibility, get to have the responsibility of removing the hindrances that come between children and Jesus. And Lord knows the world is full of hindrances, more than we could possibly count. And so for our purposes today, I want us to look at three of the most common, three that every single child No matter the family, no matter the situation, no matter where they live, who they are, every child is going to bump up against these three hindrances. And as it turns out, these hindrances track with a child chronologically, if you will. Here's a hindrance most prominent in the earliest days of their life, a hindrance most prominent in their uh, formative elementary school years, and then there is a hindrance that shows itself during those teenage years as they get ready to leave the nest. Hindrance number one, the hindrance that, as I said, uh, is most prominent generally from about birth until kindergarten, just before they leave the house, the greatest hindrance they face during that season of life is us. Yeah, that's right. You and me. Say, what? What do you how am I? Well, think about it, friends. During that brief, all too brief season of life, we have absolute utter control over their lives. Where they go, what they eat, what they wear, who they know. I mean, you name it. It's within our power. It is within our power. Control And so the question becomes, what are we doing with that tremendous season when we can exert influence perhaps like no other time? What is it that we are pouring into our children during those days? What is it that they see during those days? I submit to you that the greatest thing we can do to get ourselves out of the way, to make sure that we are not a hindrance, is to be the most diligent disciple that we can possibly be. I mean, you've heard me say it before. We, we can't give away anything that we don't possess. How on earth can we even think about discipling our children if we are not diligent disciples ourselves? If we're not pursuing Jesus with our whole heart, if we are not men and women of prayer, if we are not men and women who read and understand and know God's word, if we are not men and women who are active in the body of Christ, in community, serving others, growing with others, these are the sorts of things that not only will model for a child, this is what it means to be a disciple, it will also effectively remove us as an obstacle, as a hindrance. One of the many, many things that a disciple does, of course, is uh, what we typically call a quiet time, a devotional it's, it's that time that we set aside in our daily lives expressly to cultivate our relationship with Jesus, to pray, to be in his word, to meet with him, to learn about him, to let him speak into our lives, point out areas where we need to grow, to offer praise and worship to him, to share our concerns with him. A vital part of being a disciple, not the only part, but a very, very important part I am one of those rare birds known as a morning person. Uh, that is the time of day when I am the most alert. I am the most awake, and so that's when I like to have my quiet times. Now, before we had kids, it, it worked out great because my wife is a night person. And so I could count on every morning just a block of completely uninterrupted solitude for me to be with the Lord. And then along came Georgia, our firstborn. 
And it was almost like that child knew. Knew when dad was sitting down to have his quiet time. Because invariably, I would sit down there at my desk and begin to pray. And here comes the pitter-pat of little feet. And she's wanting a sippy cup. And she's wanting her blankie and this and that. And honestly, it, it, to begin with, I was miffed. Like, come on. I mean, I'm not just your dad. I'm also Pastor Dan. <laughs> Pastor Dan has to have his quiet time every day. Wants to have his quiet time every day. You're coming in here spoiling the whole thing. And then uh, a dear friend of mine set me straight on this, and I'll be forever grateful that he did. I was telling him one day how miffed I was about this, how she was just spoiling quiet times for Dan. And he said, Dan, listen to yourself. Dude, don't miss out on this opportunity. It's going to go by just like that. And so instead of shooing her away or being upset about it, invite her into the experience. Let her see this is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Even if she doesn't fully, rationally comprehend everything that's going on, what better legacy, what better heritage could you give to your child than for her to see her dad day after day after day meeting with Jesus? It changed my thinking completely. And so the very next day, here comes the pitter pat of little feet. Instead of getting miffed, and now we took care of the sippy cup and we took care of the blankie, and then we sat in my lap and we read the Bible together. We prayed together. And I wish I could have those days back. She just graduated from high school. I'll never get to do that again. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. This is a chance that you can set the trajectory for your child. Point them to Jesus. Help them see this is what matters in life, honey. This is life. In Jesus. And you don't have to be the most eloquent spiritual person that ever lived. You just have to love God and love your child. He loves them more than you ever will. And so he's not about to let you mess it up. If your heart's right, invite them into that opportunity. From birth until about kindergarten... If we are not careful, if we are not diligent, if we are not purposeful, the greatest hindrance can be us. But we can also be the greatest blessing during those years as well. Well, those years do go by in a hurry. And before you know it, we're putting them on the bus. And we're saying goodbye, and it seems like overnight, they're suddenly spending more time with other people than they are with us. And there are all sorts of influences coming into their lives and they're being exposed to all kinds of things and we have no control over that whatsoever. The world is there. And it's during this second phase from about kindergarten up through about junior high, the teenage years, that they bump up against hindrance number two and that is the world. The world. It's out there. And of course... We can't remove the world. Foolish to think that we possibly could. So what is our job in these years? Our job is to equip our child to navigate the world, to understand that there's good and there's evil. There's right and there's wrong. There is Jesus' way and there is a different way. We equip our children to make wise choices. The book of Proverbs in our Old Testament, one of the pieces of wisdom literature, generally speaking, divides all of humanity into two groups. There are the wise and there are the fools. And our objective in these years is to equip and help our children become wise. How do you do that? Well, there's not a wisdom pill, unfortunately, that they can take every day. No, wisdom comes through the steady drip, drip, drip of imparting wisdom to our children. 
making sure that it is front and center in their minds and in their lives, setting them in the context of wisdom, helping them begin to perceive and interpret life through the lenses of wisdom. Now, obviously, when they are that age, they they can't think in those terms. Their minds aren't developed to that point where they understand those sorts of concepts. But nevertheless, we are inculcating them into their lives. We are making them bedrock for our children. I know a group of, of grown siblings whose mom and dad did a marvelous job of discipling their kids. And when uh, our kids were coming along, I made it a point to sit down with these siblings and ask them, what, tell me, what did, what did your mom and dad do? You guys have just turned out so great. You love the Lord. You love your parents. You love each other. Tell me, what did they do? And almost in unison, they laughed, and, and together they said, Proverbs, Proverbs. Our dad loves the book of Proverbs. He reads it all the time, constantly. And they went on to share how when they were smaller children and they would get in trouble, they would make a bad choice, do something foolish, there would be, of course, the appropriate discipline or punishment, what have you, to come along. But invariably, there would also be the pulling the Bible off of the shelf and opening up to the book of Proverbs. Everything was interpreted, looked at through the book of Proverbs. It got to be, after a while, of course, a big eye roll for the kids. Oh, gosh, here comes Proverbs again. One of them even said to me, I tried to think of something bad I could do that Proverbs did not talk about. (laughs) Just so that there would be one disciplining moment in my life that my dad could not open the Bible and read from Proverbs. But, of course, as they got older, um, they saw the value of that. And as adults now who are beginning to have kids of their own, they appreciate the value of that. And one of them said to me, you know, Dan, I still go back to my daddy. She said, I, I, even as a grown-up person, I, I still bump up against things that I don't quite know what to do. I don't know how to navigate. And I'll go back to my daddy. And you know what he still does? <laughs> he takes the Bible off the shelf and we open it up to Proverbs. We look for that wisdom. We've got to cast a vision for our children. We've got to help them see things that they can't see on their own. They're not old enough. Their minds are not developed enough to understand these concepts. But nevertheless, we've got to throw it out there in ways that they can understand. Bringing the book of Proverbs, bringing the whole notion of good choices, of wise choices, of becoming a wise person versus a fool is a marvelous, marvelous way to help them navigate the world. And one other way we can help our kids navigate the world during those elementary school years is to take advantage of the larger community, the body of Christ. Do not go it alone. God never intended that we disciple our kids in a vacuum, in isolation. I know that I am biased, but I am convinced nevertheless that we have got the finest children's ministry that you will find anywhere. You can clap about that. I believe it. All three of my girls came up through that ministry, and I'm so, so thankful that they had that opportunity, that that blessing. Now, let me hasten to add, it's our job to be the primary disciplers of our kids. Kids' ministry really is supplemental, but it is a supplement you do not want to miss out on because they love children. They love Jesus. It is their joy. It is their passion to pour love for Jesus into the lives of our kids. And it is so much fun over there. It is the funnest ministry in this church. There are days when I'm feeling just a little blue, I'll wander over there to those brightly colored walls just to feel the fun vibe, to get happy again. Make sure your kids are in there with other kids and with grown-ups learning to love Jesus together, learning to make wise choices, learning to become 
the boy or the girl who will eventually be the man or woman who loves Jesus with their whole heart. It's given Jesus their whole heart. Take advantage of that community. And again, you don't have to be a parent to make this happen. Be one of those adults over there. If you love kids, whether you have kids or whether your kids are grown and gone now, invest in them over there. They're always looking for volunteers. They're always looking for people who are willing to give of their time and their knowledge, their energy, their love to make sure that our kids can navigate those years and love Jesus and be a disciple of Jesus. So when they first come into our lives, the big hindrance, the big potential hindrance is us. And we have to make choices. What are we going to model for them? But then the day comes that they get on the bus and they go off to school and with other people and the world is there. And so we've got to equip them to navigate. We've got to cast a vision. We've got to make sure that they are in this community being strengthened by others. And then comes... The third phase, perhaps the most difficult of all. They enter into those teenage years. And the hindrance at that stage is them. Yeah, (laughs) it's them. Anybody, any adult here who's walked with Jesus for any length of time understands that we are our own worst enemy. It's the person in the mirror who gives us the most trouble. The great evangelist of the 19th century, D.L. Moody. If you've never heard that name, go look it up, go Google it. Great man of God said one time, D.L. Moody has given me more trouble than any person I've ever met. And that is the gospel truth. Just as smaller children cannot grasp certain concepts, teenagers cannot grasp the notion that they are their own worst enemy. You have to mature a little bit. You have to grow up a little bit. You have to stub your toe a few times to finally get, oh, yeah, it's not everybody else's fault. No. Primary responsibility is right here. It's me. So how are we going to help them with that hindrance? How are we going to make sure that they don't trip themselves up. To begin with, I would say, make sure that they stay, stay, stay in community. I'm biased about our children's ministry. I'm biased about our student ministry. All three of my girls are coming up through that as well. And here's the thing that I love the most about our student ministry It's a missions-oriented student ministry. Yes, they have tons of fun, and yes, they do lots of cool stuff, but the overriding emphasis is serving other people. And the best way, the very best way to avoid tripping yourself up is to be focused on somebody else, to be serving others, to finally figure out, hey, life is not all about me. It's about other people. It's about sharing my faith with other people. It's about loving other people. It's about serving other people. And I don't know of a student ministry that does a better job of exposing our kids to this vital truth. That's why over 300 of our young people are going out in mission this summer. Because, yeah, you can clap about that too. Because our student leaders and our church and the body of Christ at this place called Faith Bridge understands that the greatest gift we can give to our young people, to our teenagers, is the ability to look outside of themselves and see it's a big, hurting, broken, fallen world out there. And as a follower of Christ, I have a responsibility to go into it and serve it and love it and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with it. It's amazing the radical difference that it makes in a teenager's life when they get their eyes off of themselves. I know parents who would pay money 
to have a single day with their teenager where they were thinking about somebody other than themselves. We've got a student ministry right here that is geared to do that very thing. Make sure that your teenage child understands the importance of community. Give that student ministry and those people up there, God bless them. They Get this, they love teenagers. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They really do. And they're not even their own. They love them, and they want to do everything they can to help them become the men and women of God that they've been created and called to be. Keep them in that community, and at every opportunity, show your teenage child the unconditional love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Show them the unconditional love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Insecure, trying to figure it out, wishing they were somebody else, teenagers, need to know I'm loved, and even when I mess up, I'm forgiven. I look back on my senior year with more than a little bit of shame. I had the worst case of senioritis imaginable. Just did not want to get to the finish line and a bad attitude to boot. It's a wonder that my parents did not give me the boot. And I remember one night in particular, I was as disrespectful and disobedient to them as I had ever been. And things went downhill fast. It got ugly. And I left. I left full of myself, just certain that I had put them in their place. But then as the night progressed, got to be about 10 or 11 or so, it suddenly dawned on me, i got to go back home. <laughs> and they're going to be there. So I waited really, really late. Just certain they would have already gone to bed. I could just sort of slip in under the radar. Got there, came in the back door, locked things up, started to creep down the hall. And in the house that I grew up in, there was one long hallway, went down to the bedrooms. And I looked up, and there was uh, my dad standing there. And I thought, oh boy, here it comes. And I'll never forget... He walked up to me, put his arms around me, and he said, We love you, Danny. Let's go to bed. And you know, in that moment, I think he gave me a whole new understanding of who God is. God isn't sitting around waiting to nail me. God isn't waiting for me just to mess up. Well, we had to deal with my sin. That came. But God wanted me to know, and he used my dad to show me, I still love you, and I'm going to forgive you. If we want our teenagers to get themselves out of the way, they got to know, yeah, I'm still loved. I'm still forgiven. And you know, the fact of the matter is that that need never goes away. Even after we're grown, God still wants us to know, wants us to know desperately still love you, even though you have messed up royal and you're broken and sinful and rebellious. I love you so much that I'm going to let my son give his body to be broken for you. And I'm going to allow his blood to be spilled for you that your sins might be forgiven. God knows how prone we are to forget that vital truth even after we're grown. And so he commanded us to celebrate this notion of his tremendous love, of his unconditional love and forgiveness. And it is our privilege to do that this morning at his table. We have at Faith Bridge what we call an open table. That is to say, if you love Jesus and have a relationship with him, or if you would like to have a relationship with him, you're welcome to come. In just a few moments, the ushers are going to guide us down to the front. 
You will find here uh, at front elements that are um, gluten-free for those that have that concern. We'll invite you to take one of the wafers to dip them in the cup and then partake. If you need to pray, you're welcome to do that here at our altar area. There will be persons on the sides with red shirts, our prayer partners. If you need them to pray with you, just motion. They'll be glad to come over and pray with you over whatever your concern might be. If you want to pray, you can stay and do that. If you want to return to your seat, you're welcome to do that as well. Children are a gift, no doubt. A gift and a tremendous responsibility. And whether they are biologically ours or not, if we are a part of the body of Christ, it is incumbent upon every single one of us to do what we can to position them, to give them a trajectory, to give them a direction and a movement toward Jesus because he desperately wants them to come to him to find life and to be the man or woman that he created and called them to be. Let's join our hearts together for a moment of prayer to thank God for what he's given to us and to ask him for his help in this great responsibility. Father, thank you so much for giving us your son, Jesus Christ, for allowing his body to be broken, his blood to be shed, that we might be loved and forgiven, that our sins might be cleansed, that we might step into newness of life, eternal life, Though we are completely unworthy and completely undeserving, nevertheless, you extend that to us. And for that, we are most, most grateful. We pray now you would bless this bread and this juice. May it be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. And Father, we would pray also as we come to your table, impart to us, Lord, the grace we need to be men and women who care about our kids at every stage of life, whether they are ours or not, whether we are parents or not, give to us encouraging love, focused love, vision casting love that moves and points our kids in one direction and that is toward you. Thank you for sending your son in our direction. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Dan, who just talked to us today about discipling our children. Welcome, Pastor Dan. Thanks. Glad to have you with us. Um, so uh, we didn't have any questions come in, but I do have some questions um, okay. around the message that I would love to ask. Sure. Um, so I'll just jump right in. In the beginning of your message, you talked about disciplining your children and then segued into discipling your children. Right. What is the difference? How do those relate? Well, um, they are closely related. Uh, part of discipling your child is administering discipline to your child. Uh, part of being a disciplined person is learning how to be a disciple. But in practical, everyday living, th this is the distinction that I would make. When you disciple your child, you are expressly focused on their growing relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the focal point. That's what you're dealing with. When you discipline your child, you're really dealing with all of life. You're mm -hmm. teaching them how to behave. You're teaching them that life has consequences, whether you're uh, dealing with behaviors or language 
or how they use money or whether they stay out too late, uh, you know, w whatever the case may be, it, it covers a much broader spectrum than discipling. Though, as I said, the, the two do intersect with each other a lot. Okay, good. Um, so I can't help but think about um, parents who have children who maybe are grown, mm -hmm. um, or maybe d they didn't even become believers themselves until their children were in high school or maybe um, farther, and they think to themselves, boy, I really blew it. Mm -hmm. I didn't follow much of what Dan was saying. Um, and what, what would you say to that? I think the first thing I would say is uh, don't, don't beat yourself up. If, if you have already confessed your shortcomings to the Lord and repented of that, then leave it in the past. You, you can't go back and do anything about it anyway. And so to feel guilty and to beat yourself up is counterproductive in the extreme. Instead, I would uh, begin to orient my prayer life toward asking God for opportunities to dialogue with my adult child about these matters in a gracious sort of way that the child can receive. Uh, I would uh, focus on other children that are in my sphere of influence that I can be a godly influence for. And um, I would, uh, to whatever degree I'm able, if grandkids are a part of the picture, uh, exert appropriate mm -hmm. godly influence there as well. Uh, basically, I'm saying, l look ahead. Mm, I, I heard a guy say one time, there's a reason the rear view mirror is this big and the windshield is this big. W yes, is it unfortunate that that happened? Sure, but it can't be changed. So let's just look ahead to what we can do in the future. That's good. Um, so as a parent, what are resources that you would recommend to me um, my children are younger, but what are things that you turn to as you were learning to disciple your children? Are there books or resources mm -hmm. that you could point us to just practically? Sure. Well, uh, as I mentioned in the message, take advantage of our kids' ministry. It's fantastic. And th those ladies actually could give you much more specific suggestions mm -hmm. than I am able to. So use that. Same for student ministry. Those folks are there to help. But I will tell you the sorts of things that Becky and I did with our kids. Um, we, when they were very small, we used Bible story books. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually preached through one here at Faith Bridge several years ago. Yeah, the Jesus uh, Storybook Bible. Yeah. Have uh, it at our resource center. Uh, acquaint mm -hmm. your kids with the stories of the Bible. It sticks there. Um, Make family opportunities for worship a regular part of your life. That doesn't mean you have to preach a sermon. It doesn't have to be super formal or anything. At the end of the day, as you're going to bed, you can talk about where did I see God today and what did God do in my life? Um, the, the thing that Becky and I tried to do was continually orient our children toward God. Uh, whether that was a Bible storybook or having a worship time or sometimes even in the midst of discipline, when we were learning a hard life lesson, talking about what does this mean in terms of my relationship with God and how does He feel about me in the midst of all this. Um, those are the sorts of tools that we used and um, we, we were by no means perfect, um, but we did find them to be very helpful. Good, thank you. Well, I think all of the points, no matter where you are as um, with your children, but also talking when you don't have children, looking for a place that you can sure. invest in the lives of children. Absolutely. So thank you for yeah. that message today. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.